I'd say when you have activists using violence to claim rights that in fact they already have, that's bullying. Hello and welcome to the New Humanum. My guest today is a lecturer at Oriel College, Oxford. Her name is Marie Cothar Daouda. Marie is a specialist in French literature. She's also written extensively about education and she is, of course, part of the university body and very much immersed in matters here in Oxford. Marie, welcome to the New Humanum. Thank you very much, Robin. Thank you for having me. Murray, um, you were born, weren't you, in Rabat in Morocco, and I think we always think of, of Morocco, of course, as being a, an Islamic country, but you are a Catholic. Um, tell me, how did that come about and your, your, how did you come to be a Catholic? Mm -hmm. Well, so a few words about Morocco in general. I think it's one of these countries where uh, the distinction between Muslim and Islamic might be interesting because it is, of course, culturally Muslim quite deeply. However, it is uh, very liberal. I'd say it is extremely secular by the standards of, let's say, Middle Eastern countries who would oftentimes see Morocco as the main enemy because it would be the living proof that there is a possibility of having a country where the political leader is the religious leader, but where Islam is exerted in an extremely moderate way. So as far as I'm concerned, I grew up in a family where uh, well, Islam is pretty, well, it, it is the family's religion. My parents are deeply Muslim, but my mother never covered her hair, for instance, so that would be the sort of a um, Islam that they were familiar with and they would be the first ones to be surprised by what we understand nowadays with the Islamic culture. So I was educated, I'd say, in a well, Francophile atmosphere. My parents grew up at, well, during the last years of the French protectorate. They benefited from this wonderful dual bilingual culture between French, Moroccan, classical Arabic, English, whatever they could get. So they were, and still are, culturally extremely curious and very happy to discover new things. Um, I don't think they expected their daughter to turn Catholic, but uh, I was educated in a French school. I was, I'd been given to read many of these uh, 1850s educational novels for young ladies. <laughs> so, uh, it was a wonderful reading, a wonderful introduction to Christianity. <laughs> but for my parents, they, what they saw in it was that it is just a very good teaching, a very good way for a little girl to understand what is good and what is not good. So La Comtesse de Ségur was for instance, one of these uh, writers that I enjoyed. And my interest in literature, in a way, grew from there. But when I turned, I'd say, uh, 14, 15, I discovered that there was a whole field in Christian literature that I found absolutely fascinating and that would be more specifically, well, probably at the same period, the uh, 1850s to the 1890s, um, a very aesthetic Catholicism that was rooted in the revival of the uh, well, Tridentine movement of the Counter-Reformation towards the, the middle of 19th century as a as an answer to secular laissez ideas. So I started reading these without making much of the religious sense of what I was reading. I just thought it was beautiful. And I really liked churches and I really liked religious music. And in a way, I felt myself cornered because even the pop music I was listening to was just full of religious references. Uh, I remember a 
song by placebo. So every year, every new year, one of the lines goes, uh, I'd serve my head up on a plate. And it was the moment when I had a sort of Salome obsession. <laughs> it's everywhere. <laughs> so I moved to France when I was 17 and of course started well, spending a lot of time in churches just because I thought they were beautiful buildings that told a lot about uh, part of the humanity that my country had experienced in a different way. So there is no figurative art um, but really visible in Morocco because of the Muslim mindset about figurative art. But I really liked it. And uh, I, I would spend a lot of time in these churches around where I was studying. And it took me a lot of time to bridge the gap, let's say, from the aesthetic side of Christianity to the intellectual side and then to the committed sacramental side, the uh, philosophic aspect of Christianity I found absolutely fascinating and I would read a lot about, well, what do we mean with the Trinity? What do we mean with real presence? But I was reading it with the same sort of intellectual curiosity that I would read, I don't know, Freud or Kant or whatever, just because intellectually stimulating. And it is much later, I'd say it was uh, uh, 24, 25, that it just made too much sense to be kept just as a sort of intellectual hobby. And I just wanted to have a bit more of a committed life in Christianity and stepped into the baptismal fonts. So yours was an intellectual, an intellectual pursuit an intellectual journey that you went on, but ended with the leap of faith. Mm. Yes, absolutely. It's something that uh, Carl Newman writes about quite extensively about this matter of a unity between the intellectual process and the ascent that is in fact based on trust, much more than um, faith as a sort of blurry, fading concept, cloudy, fuzzy thing. Faith is really trusting that what is taught says something true about God. So I guess behind everything, what the human brain is yearning for is truth and consistency and things that really explain the world. I couldn't find anywhere else than in Christianity, and especially in Catholicism, any answer to the problem of evil. So it, there wasn't any other form of faith, belief, choose to call it however you'd want to call it, where it was possible to have at the same time a loving, omnipotent God and people suffering and innocent children dying. And what do you think it is, what is, um, if you could encapsulate for me, your understanding of what the Christian um, understanding of evil is? Is this original sin? Is this, is this what it comes down to? Yes, absolutely. Well, th there is original sin, but uh, original sin is not the root of evil because there were more than two people involved in the dramatic scene of the original sin. It's not just a bad idea that dawned on our first parents. There was someone there tempting them. And I do believe that there is a reality to evil. And when we say deliver us from evil, it's not, well, deliver us from toothache although toothache might be one of these manifestations. But there is a necessity to acknowledge that there was a moment when God's creation, when things were invisible, chose to disobey. And some would choose to read that as an image, as a metaphor. I don't see any problem seeing this quite literally with God having created the visible and invisible world and at some point one of the invisible creatures putting himself above God and saying all that very dramatic non serviam I shall not serve and misery loves company and he just drew everyone down with him and it's just this struggle between God as creating per permanently giving and giving himself because himself is life and this destructive prideful strength that erodes the goodness in the world but that is not generative in itself so the devil cannot create something he can just destroy 
what is present. So the wonderful uh, outcome of the uh, of original sin is the Felix Culpa, which we sing during the Easter Vigil. Um, after the well, during the exile, that it's just this idea that even within this horrible fault, God found a way to unite us with Him even deeper, and that's the wonder of the incarnation and the resurrection and Pentecost and all of that glory that we're called to. Going back to your your time, your student years in France, um, my understanding of the church in France, the if you like the state of the Catholic Church in France is that it's not in a terribly healthy condition and that many people have fallen away from the faith. How did you find it as a young person surrounded, I presume, by a lively and vibrant student atmosphere? Um, where did people look on you as something of an oddity for moving to the church? Was that, I mean, how did it? Well, the first Catholics I encountered weren't very interested in telling me much, probably because I was extremely stubborn. I wouldn't have had a conversation with 17-year-old me about Catholicism. I would probably have said, well, let's give her a couple more years and see what life makes. And um, sometimes things just happen when God's, God's will wants them to happen. So I was surrounded with people who had the same intellectual curiosity as I did about Catholicism. So we would debate about the councils and why why have you started believing this then and all of that. Um, when I had committed to asking for baptism in Tatwa, it was sort of unfolding of a yearning for confession. It's not that I had done anything terrible, but it was just this desire of a unity in the honesty that is expected in confession. I knew there was something that I had to uh, that that I really needed. And uh, when I asked for baptism, I was extremely afraid of some sort of rejection, some sort of uh, judgment, because, well, I would arrive with this sort of very theoretical abstract knowledge of Christianity and Christ, what, what we do now. In fact, I spent a lot of time with uh, priests whom I still see as wonderful men of God who uh, took seriously my intellectual questions that uh, I, I wanted to be told what the church believed in a very clear way. So I did not want any uh, blurring on, of the boundaries of, uh, oh no, you're already there or whatever. So I remember having had a very firm conversation with the priest who, um, uh, with whom I was preparing for baptism. And we, it just got very firm when he had to explain to me, no, the devil cannot be redeemed. Because I had that romantic idea of, uh, of uh, maybe if something happens, but no. And we started talking about uh, Aquinas, the intelligence of the angels, why when they make a choice it is forever. And I'm, I'm just extremely grateful that I met with a priest who had the intellectual courage and firmness to tell me, well, no, that is not what you believe if you believe in what the church believes. And at some point there was there is a necessity of knowing, well, either you're in or you're out. It's not a it's not a pick and mix of uh, I like this dogma, but I don't like this one. It's yes. uh, I, so I think I had a lot of erroneous ideas at the beginning. <laughs> but uh, there there were people that were well meaning enough to take me where well at the point where I was and have all these conversations. So um, mm. I'm extremely grateful for that. And I also had the chance to be uh, immersed both in the uh, Novus Ordo liturgy and in the Tridentine liturgy. Both churches were at about 150 meters from one another. So that too was quite a grace to have a connection. Well, it's interesting you should say that because you, you often hear commentators talk about um, liberal Catholics or conservative Catholics. And I think that um, the truth is, as you say, I, I don't know if you'd agree, that really um, there is a unity in the faith and it is quite clear what we can believe and what we should believe and what is not true and what we should not believe. But mm -hmm. that um, perhaps that's put some people off, the idea that we have uh, very 
clear, dogmatic even, views on these things. Well, if you look closer at the connections between the dogmas, they're pretty convincing. The uh, idea, let's say, for instance, of the assumption that Our Lady, well, some might disagree, some might say, well, no, it's not really a matter of faith. It, it is attested in tradition, but above that, dogmatically, you have this question of the flesh that our Lord took. So he took flesh of the Virgin Mary. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? If we say that in the creed, are we willing to draw all the consequences? So he took flesh of the Virgin Mary, which means that his flesh is derived from her human flesh. So in that sense, if he is elevated in his glorified body, there is no reason why her glorified body would not benefit from the same grace. And it all goes well, as it is said in the Catechism, to the fact that to God nothing is impossible. Mm -hmm. If this is what is attested and just derives from what we have in the Creed with the of flesh of the Virgin Mary, then we just have to draw these consequences. And if the consequences we draw are different, then it's personal belief, it's not the Catholic faith. We can have personal beliefs, but we cannot wrap them and coat them pretending it is the Catholic faith. So it's just one of the points on which one has to be uh, intellectually honest. And if one disagrees with the church, it is a point of disagreement. It's not, well, I'm just adapting things to my own beliefs. Not really how it works. Now you you um, were a student when you were at the Sorbonne. Yes. And um, there you... You wrote your dissertation, am I right, about French literature. You, yes. you, studied, uh, you studied French literature at the Sorbonne. Um, did you find in the literature that you studied, did you find inspiration there for your, your, your Catholic faith? Is the, were the writers that you were studying, I know for instance that you studied Baudelaire, mm -hmm. um, that, did you find inspiration in that, in a religious sense? Well, Baudelaire would not explicitly be labelled as a Catholic writer and on a personal crusade to maintain that a lot of his writings are actually quite close to dogma. I think one of the striking, one of my striking misreadings was of Vismans. So he's usually seen as one of these pillars of the Catholic revival. So he was a naturalist, so very close to Zola, very close to this idea of describing the grossness of humanity as in well, the worst possible ways, then he shifted towards some sort of symbolism, decadence, but he's mainly remembered as a Catholic writer. And when I read the first of his novels that is seen as Catholic, En Route, I don't think I understood anything in it. I think that there were many things that I, well, I would understand it intellectually, but I, I didn't really see the implications. So. In a way, there is a way of reading literature that makes it impossible to access the realities of faith behind it, what the writer is really talking about, if one does not know this faith with a certain level of personal commitment. Mm -hmm. So, Which is not to say that uh, one has to be Catholic to understand Rismans, but it really helps. <laughs> <laughs> so, these Catholic writers, I'd say, ended up being very helpful, providing words a posteriori. So after conversion, I could phrase certain intuitions in words that had been beautifully crafted earlier. But while I was reading these words, well, it's literally pearls in front of the pigs, which I just <laughs> thought, I, I, would, I wouldn't even see the value of it. See, you, you, you read a sentence where you'd have uh, an author randomly dropping real presence. If you just know intellectually, this is a Catholic writer, he would know of real presence. Well, it's fine. Don't misunderstand the text. But having some sort of sense of what this writer must have had experienced believing in real presence, receiving Holy Communion, adoring the Blessed Sacrament, that gives it a more um, incarnate reality, if I may say. So you were, you were schooled in Paris, mm -hmm. you were an undergraduate in Paris, but now you're 
here in Oxford. How does that come about? Oh, well, um, I finished my doctorate, started teaching a secondary school, doted on my pupils, but realised I would not have any second left for research or personal readings. And I knew I really wanted to do that. I uh, knew that my calling was just as much towards teaching as towards researching and it was not possible in that frame. Providentially, a friend of mine told me that uh, his mentor at Modlin, while he was a lecturer there, there, worked on symbolism and Christian literature. That's enough for me to marry him. And uh, I wrote to that professor who told me, well, I'm about to retire, but one of my former students is now teaching at Oreo. You should probably drop him a line. And well, the rest is history. And um, while I was awaiting for the situation to clarify whether or not I'd be giving up on my Parisian dreams and moving to Oxford, I, uh, I completed my master's degree in English literature and had this uh, well, opportunity to discover a bit more about Cardinal Newman, whom I had met while writing my thesis, but just knowing a bit more about all this, well, this question of apologetics in an Anglican context, which is quite different from apologetics in a laicite context. It's a, well, the focus is different, so it was a, a good mind-opening experience just to discover that there are different approaches to similar problems in other countries. When you uh, contrast the situation in France vis-a-vis -vis religion in the public square, and the situation in Britain, what, what do you notice? Are there, are there great differences, would you say, in the, what I mean is that um, I think in, in Britain, in my experience, uh, politicians, for instance, rarely talk about religious matters. Um, people are scared of the subject, I think. Is that the same in France? Well, I'd say it's worse in France in a certain way because of the laws on laicity. So I, I was teaching a Catholic school, so I could talk about things. But I, I was still uh, slightly chided when I started talking about things like the Eucharist when teaching Teresa Scrolls. And Explain uh, laicity to an English ooh. audience. What does it mean exactly? Uh, laicity is, um, well, I think a poor translation, poor attempt at translation would be secularism. Yes. But it's not exactly that because laicity emerged from the French revolutionary idea that there should be no connection between the state and the church and therefore that there should be no explicit signs of religious belonging either displayed by individuals or by institutions and that can go quite quite far and a lot of the debates that we've heard of lately about uh, wearing the the Islamic veil in public, yes. things like that, are linked to this problem of laicity because it was these these laws on separating the the, the state and the church. Well, speci specifically, it was about the church, so it was not crafted as a way to give a frame for Muslims in France. So, in a way, one of the difficulties of laicity in France is how to answer to religions that pose completely different problems than Catholicism. Catholicism went with a whole set of problems in the Ancien Regime. There was a serious problem of uh, well, uh, holding belongings, well, mainly land belongings, in an unlawful way. And all that. So the revolution did not come from nowhere, but these laws end up sounding a bit clumsy when applied to Islam in France or even to a certain extent Judaism in France. So uh, one of the things that people have a hard time understanding is the discrepancy between how these laws happen to exist and how hard it is to apply them nowadays. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it, it just doesn't seem to fit, does it? It doesn't. What's your own view of that? That, um, you know, the, the idea that uh, the hijab or um, Islamic Muslim women not being allowed to cover themselves in a traditional way. Um, that, as you know, is something which um, in Britain uh, we have no problem with. Mm -hmm. And um, I think people would consider it to be profoundly un-British, actually, to 
to forbid people to wear whatever headgear they wanted yes. to wear. Mm -hmm. Whereas um, the French, who we think of as, of, as very liberal and tolerant, um, uh, have a problem with this. I mean, what is, where, where do you, what do you think about that? Do well, that's a very interesting question, especially given what is going on in Iran at the moment, where the, <laughs> well, what, women refuse to be forced to, ve to wear the veil. So, uh, um, well, in Islam, as I knew it, it should be a matter of personal choice. It's, uh, it should mirror a very deep conviction that this is an expression of the faith as a certain individual wants to live it. Which doesn't mean that a woman who's not wearing the veil is less of a Muslim or is a bad Muslim, whatever. So you'd have many radical Muslims telling you, well, no, it is a mandatory precept. And you'd have other, more well, milder Muslims who'd use other authorities in Islam saying, well, no, it is actually possible for a woman to choose depending on her mm -hmm. circumstances, depending on where she's living, depending on her personal choice. So the problem is about making things mandatory or not. And in Iran, for instance, women do not rebel against the possibility of wearing the veil, it's about not having the choice. In France, what we notice is that there is, well, it, it is forbidden. One of the explanations for that, that uh, many politicians actually don't dare to phrase, is that it's not about Islam per se, it's about the political implications of having a social group in the country isolating in such a way that they would have their own laws, they would have their own principles and precepts, which I'm afraid, uh, well, well th th there, were, there were these uh, riots between uh, Sunni Islams and Shia Islams, uh, uh, Sunni Muslims and Shia Muslims, in, uh, about that film. And seeing these conflicts being imported into Britain is something that I find extremely saddening because when I arrived, one of the things I found wonderful is that Britons have every possible accent, they have every possible colour, they dress however they want, it goes from the punk to the uh, mother <laughs> having the, the scarf, it's, and, and anything goes, as long as there is a shared identity. Yes. So I firmly believe that a country where people sing, well, God save the Queen when I arrived, God save the King now, is a country that has a transcendent referent, and that it's not so much a matter of obey to the laws of the country as the laws of the country are supposed to mirror something greater about which we could all agree. You, I, I read something about uh, what you had said about a sense of belonging here and mm -hmm. you, you do feel um, that you belong here, that you, you feel a, a loyalty to Britain. I feel a loyalty to Britain because it's a country that has given me a chance. I think there is a, well, just a sort of very basic sense of gratitude that we should not be ashamed of having. It's a, I'm very happy here. It is a country that, well, I don't legally belong to, but at the same time, I can make use of my talents here in such a way that I could not in France, in such a way that I could not in Morocco. Why, so. what would have prevented you from doing the same thing in France? Well, I tried and it didn't work. <laughs> so, more seriously, given the nature of my studies, given that I, uh, I work a lot on these matters of how historically Catholic France is, it is something that is not quite acceptable in French universities. Right. So it's just not something people are interested in. While here, there is in a way the... Uh, opposite side of the debate, which would be, let's say, theologians who don't believe in God, but who just find it fascinating to work on matters of theology, which I find rather wholesome in a way, that uh, there would be this possibility of using thought in diverse ways, and that there would not be too much political constraints on what can be done intellectually. Well, that is fascinating. I mean, the idea that that um, the French, perhaps, uh, do you think that they, do you think that this, an exploration of the 
Catholic roots in France is in some way an embarrassment to modern Frenchmen? I think it's a problem of uh, incompatibility between the reality and the discourse. The reality in France is that you cannot see a bottle of wine or a cheese without saying a saint's name. <laughs> it's just the way it is because it's history. France yes. has been Catholic for so long. But when I also when I received French citizenship, there was this ceremony that I found very moving and very awkward because it made everything date back to 1789 while showing pictures of Versailles. <laughs> so, uh, are you, what, what are you really talking about? So France has roots that are linked to the monarchy and to Catholicism and everything shows it. There is to this Republican component that cannot be denied, but if people came to terms with this cultural past, I think in fact it would make life easier for many immigrants. They would know better way, where they are. So one of the difficulties that is present in France now is that there is a strong Catholic revival, especially after COVID and the lo lockdowns, the churches are filling again with young people who have rediscovered what real presence means because they experienced real absence. So if this is the drive that is pulling young people nowadays, what is the narrative that can be provided around it? Do we stick to a post-revolutionary narrative or do we go back to something historically more resilient to show that, well, yes, the Republic does exist, but it came from something else, mm -hmm. and this something else is what France still benefits from. Just listening to you talking, I was reminded of that famous quip by Mao Zedong when he was asked what he thought of the French Revolution, and he said, well, it's too early to tell. <laughs> <laughs> That's quite true. And, and uh, you know, the idea that maybe France is still digesting in a cultural sense and in a sense of understanding its own history. Yes, absolutely. The revolution. Well, one of the problems of the revolution is that the head of the state had been chopped off, both concretely and metaphorically. So after this passage, well, I, I have a very hard time explaining to my students what happened in 19th century France. Mm -hmm. So, well, uh, there's <laughs> la terreur, and then, uh, well, it gets a bit better, but then we have an emperor, and then, well, that fails, so we have a republic again. But then that fails, so we go back to a monarchy. So it's just, oh, it, it, it's just a bit of a mess. Yes. And uh, one of the explanations for that is that there is no stable, legitimate form of power. So anyone can try to embody this power. What I find fascinating with Napoleon is that he represented this dream of Mr. Nobody coming from Corsica and being crowned, being at the head of a state that is rooted in the Roman Empire. So it's just this desire to go back to something legitimate that one sees all through the 19th century France in, uh, in its historical as well, going back and forth. And then one very interesting moment is the Second Empire, which is in fact the empire of money. We switch from the empire of men being able to follow the emp their emperor as far as Russia for better and for worse <laughs> to bankers. The uh, it, it led to a lot of well, sense of disharmony, sadness, and lack of the, the lack of the epic. The, uh, the, there was no prospect for being a hero anymore. And after this, well, the collapse of the Second Empire, you'd have the Third Republic, even more bankers, the sort of art <laughs> morale, fake idea of morality, because no one has the moral high ground anymore, so anyone can pretend to do that. And then, there's the tragedy of the First World War, where heroism was destroyed. Both in, and it's the same thing for Britain, when uh, you'd see all these young men going to be well, just destroyed, mm -hmm. and all that remains of them is a name on a plaque who cannot sing their praises, saying how wonderful they were, because there is no individual form of heroism anymore. 
So that's what France has lost from the beginning to the end of 19th century. There is no sense of legitimacy, no sense of political authority, and no sense of heroic dignity either. Um, you now teach here in Oxford, and so you're immersed in the university body, familiar, I'm sure, with student culture here. Um, what do you make of the young people that uh, you, you see around you in the college and in the city? Do you, um, we, it is commonly said that Britain is a, a post-Christian society, that the Christian church has lost its purchase here, and that, that, um, that there is a, a lot of ignorance of Christian culture and Christian history in Britain. Do you see that amongst your students? I'd say there is a lack of exposure in a way, which uh, at times can be manifest when they wouldn't really understand what a passage is about. So there is a text by Flaubert in Trois Contes about a parakeet that is supposed to be a sort of parody, but also an homage to the to the Holy Spirit. So they don't really have the references, which does not mean that they're not intellectually curious about it. So one of the things that made me feel at home, specifically in Oriel, is that the sense of it being a Christian community is still present. Is it? Yes. Uh, the, well, the chapel is still alive and well. Yes. There is a lot going on there. And the uh, well, Sunday Even Song draws students from every possible faith background, which I find wonderful because it just shows that there is something that we can partake in as a community linked to one another aesthetically by the beauty of the service and that at least provides a shared culture and it is possible to know this culture to know it quite extensively without converting it is clearly a possibility but many students are in fact Christian curious. So we we hear a lot about the liberal ones, about the well, this extreme uh, uh, authoritarian progressivism that we see nowadays. But the students are human beings, and they want the truth like everyone else. And if all we can offer them is a relativist narrative of there is no such thing as truth, uh, all the religions are the same, all of that watering down of any sort of a spiritual food that well, the, the, the fault is on us, not on them. Mm -hmm. So we have to show that this is available, which does not mean hammering the catechism on the table, but uh, at least they would know that there are people around who believe in something. So when they have deep troubling questions, they would know that it is possible to ask these questions, and there are questions worth asking. And how do you, as a Moroccan by birth, a Muslim by early upbringing, a French woman by education, now a, a teacher in Oxford, how do you make sense, what do you make of the Anglican tradition in, in, in England? <laughs> I'd say, well, there are Anglicans and Anglicans, right? It's uh, it's just as diverse as uh, in Catholics and Catholics. But um, given that there hasn't been this caesura of Vatican II, in many aspects, there are things in the Anglican tradition that are very close to the, uh, say, uh, well, Tridentine. Mm -hmm. tradition. Yes. However, there are also dogmatic differences that we should not dismiss or neglect because that would not be respectful. That if, if there are things we disagree on, it's better to agree to disagree than to pretend that we actually do believe the same thing. Mm -hmm. So I particularly enjoy having conversations with uh, Anglicans of good faith who are interested in seeing the difference of meanings that both churches can have 
uh, can, can give two similar words. So uh, talking about the Eucharist, for instance, in the Catholic Church, we do believe that it is a memorial, but it is also far more because we would take the words of our Lord during the Last Supper extremely literally. And if he says, this is my body, well, this is his body. And it is in the light of the Last Supper that we look back at the discourse on the bread of life in St. John and see that, well, what is said about the bread of life in St. John just announces and foreshadows the Last Supper. So we start, let's say, with the same text, but we would draw different conclusions from it. Yes. And it would be a bit disrespectful to deny that there are these differences, which doesn't mean that we cannot talk about it. And I, I think we have to. So um, there are matters of uh, well, ecclesial differences now, like the ordination of women, things like that, that make this reunion harder, but at an individual level, there is a lot to share with one another and to and to explore. So uh, I would, I, I firmly believe that the Bible is a product of the Catholic Church, and that it is, let's say, the the, the, the condensed form of tradition, but that Scripture is better understood and unfolded when one benefits from this whole flow and continuity of tradition and. I know many Anglicans who are sincere believers who would disagree with me on this point. And I cannot pretend that, oh no, we, we, we do agree on that and <laughs> wrap it in, put it in sugar. Yes. So it's, um, it, it has been said recently that, um, that the, church, the Church of England, the Anglican Church, could be seen as an umbrella under which because, of course, unlike in France with laicity, um, the church here is established and the connection between crown and church and state is quite clear um, in the constitution, unwritten though it is. Um, and therefore, having the church, as it were, as a recognized part of the state setup, it allows other religions to flourish in its sheltering embrace. That's a quite a comforting notion, do you think? Yes, absolutely. Well, it's something of which the, the, well, one of the first moments when I felt this was a good place to be was during Remembrance Day, so the first 11th of November I was here. There was this memorial service, which was obviously explicitly Anglican, and then people from other faiths joining in prayer with the specificities of their own beliefs, but just united in goodwill. And at a national level, I don't think there is more we can hope for. I, I don't believe in integralism. I believe that the more secular power the church gets, the closer it gets to the, the, the absurdity of, uh, well, the, the absurdities that happened during the, the uh, 16th century. And we don't want that. But what can be provided is the sense that there is a stability, like you said, the church is established, but that there is room for other, other expressions of goodwill. So what matters is the goodwill. We might not even mean the same thing when we say, well, Jews, Muslims, Christians believe in one God. If you look at it in the detail, even this statement, is, well, there is a lot to unpack in there but we can all wish well for our fellow human being, our fellow citizen, because after all, if something bad happens to, come to, to the country, we're, we're in it together. Mm. So it creates a sense of um, a hopeful look towards the future of what can happen to these communities sharing the same space and building something together rather than arguing about, well, I come from here, you come from there, my ancestors believe this, your ancestors believe that. We have something to do that is in, well, in the present towards the future, and praying together, I believe, is a good way to do that. You, of course, being at Oriel College, have been at the epicenter of one of the great upheavals in, in, in national life, in a way, 
um, you know, the Rhodes must go. And of course, Rhodes was himself a man or warrior and a benefactor to the college. And there was all the row about the statue. How, do, how, how did you compute all that? I mean, what did you think about it? Well, at first I felt offended that there would be this idea that anyone from an ethnic minority should feel endangered by the statue of Cecil Rhodes up there. The only way it could hurt anyone is if the statue falls or if you crane your neck too much and have a neck pain. But if you look at these matters seriously, this statue is part of an architectural ensemble on which there are kings, there are cardinals. And isn't it amazing that you know, in early 20th century Oxford, where Jews and Catholics had just been allowed to be full members of mm -hmm. the university, there would be cardinals on this facade. And you have these kings in full regalia, and you have Cecil Rhodes with his hat and just looking like he's just out of the office, isn't he? And it's a bit absurd to see this statue as a monument to imperialism, because there are many other narratives, much more uniting, that could be written about that and that would be, in fact, closer to the intentions of the, archi uh, the architect. So uh, Cecil Rhodes did not want a statue. What he wanted was to leave money to the college because, as he said, well, uh, the fellows of the, the college are like children in masses of money. That's how he called them <laughs> in his will. And he just had this perception that if he didn't do something, his college will collapse. And there is a lot of arrogance in saying, well, this man who did or did not do horrible things in South Africa deserves to be erased from history. Because nowadays, I mean, we're trading with lots of countries I will not name where slavery is alive and well. And we do that because there are financial expectations and no one is protesting against that. No. So it's just a matter of consistency. If what we reject is the whole imperial mindset, its connections to slavery and war, why don't we change the present rather than use a statue as a scapegoat? So what I found perplexing was how the statue managed to catalyze all the tensions at the very complicated moment of well, the lockdown, the death of George Floyd. So it was the ideal scapegoat. And in a way, it, it just, it was a textbook case of uh, what Jean-Luc Marion explains as well, turning an icon into an idol. So the statue is, in fact, well, it receives much more attention and inverted worship being seen as a sign of all these things rather than being pleasantly ignored as we used to. <laughs> There's no harm in pleasantly ignoring monuments. No. I mean, it's a... It's, it's a sort of displacement activity, yes, isn't absolutely. it? Yes, yeah. Because, of course, the, the, the problems to which you allude, the, the ongoing injustices that there are in countries with which, as you say, we trade, um, makes a mockery, really, of this whole anti-slavery movement because, of course, the constructive thing to do would be to campaign against the slavery which is actually here and now yes, rather than what happened 150 years ago? Mm -hmm. Did you? Did you? Um, but did you have sympathy that the Black Lives Matter, the Black Lives Matter movement? Did you empathise with it at a basic level? Or I, I tend to be a bit cautious about any crowd movement, and when it had been revealed that the well that the financial activities behind Black Lives Matter were far from being as charitable as they seem to be. I, I must say, I, I felt slightly vindicated. I firmly believe that Black Lives Matter because I firmly believe that all lives matter because I believe that we are all created in the image of God and that we have a fundamental human dignity that ought to be protected. So, of course, race, racism exists, but turning this problem into coordinated, 
protests and synchronized taking the knee and all of that does not solve anything. If anything, it has in fact created a deeper division, so much so that people who were in fact well, full of goodwill towards these matters now do not want to hear about it anymore. And I think that's the danger when a good cause is instrumentalized in such a way that people end up being fed up with it, that there is serious danger. And we see that nowadays with uh, climate activists who use toxic glue to <laughs> plaster their signs everywhere. It's, of course, climate is important. And of course, we have duty of care towards the planet. But sitting in the middle of the street and endangering oneself and other pedestrians and the drivers is not a solution. I think these are you know, acts that are especially designed for social media. Mm -hmm. It attracts what they call clout. It creates a lot of noise. It does not work in changing the real problems that we are facing. So if all this energy was in fact challenged towards rekindling a serious interest in these causes at a more humane level, we'd go much further. We hear a lot about cancel culture and no platforming, and there is a lot written about a sort of growing intolerance, particularly in uh, universities and in higher education generally, where um, unpopular or possibly unfashionable views um, are sort of banished from the public square. Do you, do you notice that close up uh, in Oriel, in Oxford generally? Oh, yeah. Not so much in Oriel because thankfully it's a small community and we know each other and we say hello to each other and we try as much as possible to really be kind to one another. Um, what I find surprising is the imbalance between the care given to some communities, some minorities and not others. I would be very happy to see people wearing crosses as a sign of support to the Christians martyred regularly in Africa. I wouldn't go, well, as far as, well, maybe I would, in fact. I, I do feel triggered by all the, the evolutive rainbow flags. It now looks like a sort of zebra carnival flag. I, I was all in for preventing any acts of harassment against homosexuals. I, I think obvious acts of uh, homophobia are dreadful and it has to be prevented because it does cost lives. I'm not sure trans activists have done any favor to this idea that, well, no matter what we think of the acts in of themselves, the persons have to be protected and taken care of in, with as much care, love and charity as, as possible. I'd say when you have activists using violence to claim rights that in fact they already have, that's bullying. A man dressed as a woman absolutely has the right to go to the men's loo. It's, it has never been forbidden <laughs> to them to do that. It's, it, it's just about making sure that there are that there is no collateral damage. Mm -hmm. And I have the impression that women, Christians, young girls, um, people with disabilities are suffering a lot from this focus on trans activism. Well, if someone wants to wear a dress while being a man, well, that's, that's fine. But that doesn't make that person a woman and that should not take the focus out of people who actually really need care and protection. So we have, uh, well, Trans Awareness Month, all that. The Disability Awareness Month has gone completely under the radar. No mm. one did anything about that. And why? Why would you think that it was that, or why do you think it is that that the trans issue has become, as you say, so high profile, whereas the um, the as you say the disability, uh, the, the the problem of that, disable, that disabled people face is much lower down the, mm. much lower down the agenda. Well, you know, when, when a movement is taken by strong people, it tends to go hard. Um, most of the trans activists are men, 
men are biologically on average stronger than healthy women what we notice is that well you know that there is this canon law principle that the laws are meant to protect the weak against the strong and in this trans activist movement what we see is the strong wanting to take even more rights and managing to do it so to me it is in no way an egalitarian movement it is a men's right movement it has to be said as plainly as it is there is a huge difference between men wanting to be women and women wanting to be men when you see the detransitioning girls who regret having transitioned into men mm -hmm. it's, it's just ghastly ghastly stories which most of the time would end in an amount of damage that is never explained to them before they begin the transition why because there's a whole lobby behind it financial power here again with people who know that they can make a lot of money out of it and they would never assess the serious mental health distress going on for that person in such a way that would just allow the young boy young girl to take some time grow out of it we grow out of many many things and now we have these affirmed care mm. surgeries that are uh, if if you told somewhere in the craziest time of decadent Rome oh well we're going to turn this little boy into a little girl that they'd be horrified <laughs> <laughs> so I, I really worry about what people might think or not think of our time in 200 years from now because either they look at us and think we're complete fools or they'll look at us and think well we're just the continuity of that and they would be much more um, much worse than what we are so in a way if we just put the focus back on the reality of people needing care people needing support people needing help and started from there rather than starting from who has the power from the lobbies who has the power from laboratories who has the power from environmental alle allegedly environmental enterprises we would do something that really benefits people i want to turn my um questions towards education and the education of children. I know that you are a fan of um, Mrs. Bobel Singh, the, the so-called strictest headmistress in, in Britain, um, and the need for children to have, to be disciplined and to work in a disciplined environment in school. Tell me your thoughts on that and, and why, why do you feel that uh, it is the case that children need firm discipline. Mm -hmm. Well, a few words on Catherine Bebel Singh. She, she's a lady I have an immense admiration for. I, I, I don't really like the, the word fan because no. it, it was like, I mean, a groupie harassing her with text messages and all that. No, no, she, she's someone I admire a lot because she has the courage to follow on her ideas and principles that are oriented towards the good of the children. She could have it easier being less strict. The thing is, well, I do believe that the well, the strictest headmistress is a fun trademark. <laughs> it's a, uh, well, if, if it works, if it can attract people's attention, it's good. Um, when I visited that school, what I saw was, well, a group of happy, confident kids who, know, who, who knew why they were there. And my worst memories of school were moments when I was just saying, oh, is this even worth it? They know it's worth it because they know that whatever they're going through is helping them achieve higher success. And they see that as a possibility towards a better life. Now, on the question of boundaries, structure, I, I think we all need structure. It's not just about children. If you, if you look at most of the self-help books or the self-help tweets it's a well 10 hacks that will change your life you have to wake up at 5 a.m go for a run do this do that it's so extremely authoritative <laughs> and we, in, in fact we do like that mm -hmm. we're reassured when there is a clear frame our body feels better everyone would say that with regular signs of sleep food things coming at a predictable pace because it means safety and you know, th there is this 
liberty versus safety debate, I do believe that the just using liberty as an empty word when people feel insecure is the best way to turn people into useful activist tools. It's because people feel insecure that they would yearn for more liberty, more liberty, because they believe that this liberty, in fact, will lead to safety. It's when you have someone, well, campaigning, let's say, let's take the worst possible example, let's take a trans activist of good faith. That person would say, well, I'm campaigning for my liberty so that I would be safe to be who I really am. So the dissociation between liberty and safety is more a matter of cycle than a matter of radical opposition. So when it comes to children, when a child does not have any structures, limits, when a child has no, no one to rely on to say, well, this is what you should do, this is what you should not do, the child will just be trying things randomly and then will stop because a child will be afraid because the world is a terrifying place when you're a child and a child will need someone to tell him or tell her you should not cross the street now because it's red i'll show you well step by step we'll get there at some point um, nowadays there is a huge trend towards turning every possible relationship into friendship which is debasing the sacredness of friendship as it should be, but also very harmful for children. So suppose you're seven year old, your father wants to be your friend, your mother wants to be your friend, the teacher wants to be your friend. That's wonderful, but in the end of the day, it means you had no father, no mother, no teacher. Children need someone to own up and to say, well, I, as the grown up in the room, tell you, you should do this. And they feel grateful for it. Um, what you say about uh, the um, the link between firm rules and structure, and um, thus creating um, a sense of safety and security, do you think that applies to religion also? I mean, it strikes me that you know when I look at Catholicism, I'm, I'm I've been a Catholic all my life. And the, um, I recognize in what you say that actually one of the attractions of the faith to me is that it provides this firm structure, this Absolutely. firm, um, and uh, which lays down clear rules uh, about what is right and what is wrong. Yes. Well, one of the things that I appreciate in uh, the Anglican. Holy Communion service is starting with the Ten Commandments. Here's what you should not do. Mm -hmm. I, I think Catholics tend to blur it out a bit. Um, when, when I was helping the children in my parish with catechism, we had this question answer catechism with very precise answers to what is prayer, what, why shall we pray? And it wasn't sort of very fuzzy answers. Prayers is an, uh, prayer is an act of worship. We have to do it because God asks us for and prayers and prayer makes our heart closer to God's heart. So you can develop on that as much as you want, but that's the core of it. Now, when it comes to structure, what is wonderful about Christianity is Sunday. It's just, so I started uh, first going to church on Sundays, then every day. But when I started going to church on Sunday, I was working pretty much 24-7 on my thesis. It was a, a non-stop flow of, I have to write, I have to work, I have to read things. And my first form of Christian discipline was, no, it's Sunday, today we worship the Lord. <laughs> stop, uh, stop all the clocks. And uh, there was that day in the week that stood out. And then there was daily mass. So there was the time in the day that stood out. And, you know, if, if your timetable is just a long flow without knowing when to work and when to rest, that's a very good recipe for mental breakdown. Mm -hmm. it's, it's not how we're wired to. It's a, th there is a moment for resting, not just because our body needs it, but because we're not machines. We need what we're really meant for, which is contemplation. We need to stop and wonder. And if there is no time, in our day, in our week, to stop and wonder, we've, we've lost. We have become just as 
dehumanized as the laptop we're using. So we're not laptops, we're not going on and on and on, we're we're supposed to stop and look at the sky, the beautiful brown leaves, the beautiful autumn day we're having today. There are some writers, some commentators who say that, uh, or see, are very pessimistic about the future. They see almost civilizational collapse in Europe. They see Europe jettisoning and putting to one side its Christian heritage and thus in danger of losing the thing, the very thing from which the civilization grew. And um, what do you think about that kind of view? Are you pessimistic, optimistic about about the future? Well, I think I think we have a commandment to optimism in a way. The, the whole story of the gospel is that when it's it, it is when things reach their worst, darkest points that the wonder is about to happen. And the, C.S. Lewis Chronicles of Narnia is all about that. It, I, I don't know if you ever le- read The Last Battle, but yes. uh, to me it's a, it's a monument of theology. It's, <laughs> everything goes wrong, but, but no, that there is still Aslan. So, of course, materially, technically, well, it does seem like we're all not doing, doing that well. But if we choose to believe that God is in command, God is in control, we are not allowed to turn pessimism into uh, wallowing despair. Despair is a sin. We can hope against all hopes, which implies being very aware of how bad things are. We have a duty of charity to make things better, but despairing is a deadly sin. Despairing is what Judas did. He just decided that his situation was something that God himself could not fix. So no matter how aware we are of how wrong things are, it should not rip away our hope. Hope is a virtue we have to nurture and pray for, and despair is just as simple as Gypsy's end. I'm sure all the young people that you've come across will be very worried and anxious about um, many things, but uh, climate change is one of the things. Um, do, do you, um, can you reassure? Do you try to reassure young people? Yes, uh, the, the first thing I usually say to reassure them is that if they're feeling despaired, what they need is to have a good meal and a long night of sleep. <laughs> It usually solves a lot of problems at this age. <laughs> and beyond that, well, jokes aside, once they believe that even at their tiny little level, they can make a difference without yelling on the streets, without campaigning all that, but that the person next to them might be in need for help and might seriously need them, it sparks something inside it kindles the, the, just the fire of charity. So I, I remember telling my uh, um, secondary school students many years ago, well, y- you might be someone's only chance to feel good today. So they might do more good by asking their friend, how are you doing? Or saying hello to someone who looks a bit worried and lonesome than by shouting Extinction Rebellion things on the street. So if they can solve a problem right here, right now, by bonding with someone next to them, it usually keeps them busy (laughs) in such a way that makes all the activism seem, well, the emptiness that it is. So um, activism is meant to fill a void. Most of young people nowadays feel useless. They have the impression that There is nothing they can do, that they don't matter, that they're worthless. They have an immense worth, but they discover it when they start being generous, when they start being the one who shares, who gives, who's open to the other. So I I do take be kind quite seriously. It it should not be turned into empty words. And being kind, it's, it's a wonderful tool against depression. So when you have a child in front of you, yeah. who seems clinically depressed, getting this child to do something 
to see the benefits of what he or she is doing is a wonderful way out and it works for the grown-ups too. To be able to see and... Uh, Whatever is not given is gotten. <laughs> All of that. Ari <laughs> Thank you very much. Indeed. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you.